My name's Nathan. I'm with ComicBurst.com, and today we're here with Nicole Jobin. Nicole, can you tell us a little bit about this comic books in the classroom? It's uh, this exciting thing that I just came across, and I think I think the community would be very interested in hearing about, all about it. It started a little while ago, probably. Well, I was still teaching in Las Vegas, and I was working with the ESL kids, and I was the only English speaker in the room. So we had that barrier already to communication, and they were learning to read, and they were learning the language, and we consistently found reasons why we couldn't understand text as well as, you know, a regular native speaker. So, right. Um, Heinle and some of the other publishers were putting out books that were accompanied with pictures. So there was lines of text along with the picture that kind of described what the text said. And then a couple pages later, there'd be the entire news story and then some questions for comprehension. We started using those books. My kids started to do really well as, as far as reading and gaining vocabulary. Right. And um, it kind of blew up from there. So I started getting just the graphic novel adaptations for things. And I just put them on my bookshelf. And they kind of used those for, you know, like choice reading. Um, as we started to transition into FSA and there was room for other media, um, we started to kind of play with using it. So um, I was teaching at Westwood Middle and I was teaching a group of sixth graders. So um, <laughs> it can get pretty hairy those last schools. So um, I asked her, I, she says, well, do you guys have any ideas for different things we could read to keep the kids engaged and at least doing some work that we could push them to the next you know, grade level standards. Sure. And I was like, I want to do a comic book. And she said, you do? And I taught predominantly intensive reading, which means that they scored lower on the, on the FGA or the FSA. Okay. So they were scoring ones or twos. So they're definitely below reading level for the grade. I presented a few novels, a few graphic novels, and the only one we could get for free was um, the PDF of Chris Claremont's X-Men, God Loves Man Kills. Oh. Now, I know that the first thing out of people's mouths when they hear this is going to say, well, there is a word in that text. And I'm like, well, yeah, there is a word. Yes. I brought it to my attention, uh, to the attention of my admin, and she said, well, just write it out in the book. Now, I had printed the PDF so I could write that out, but I showed them the color version of the PDF, so there's no way to write it out in the color version. Right. So, but the... But the but the pages they had in front of them, it was whited out, and they couldn't see what the word was. And um, they started reading, and they started talking about the differences in characters. And a lot of the conversation hinged on what they started asking, what they were interested in. Hmm. So we talked about characters, and we talked about facial expressions, and we talked about, you know, how the characters were depicted through picture. And then we talked about, you know a lot of the allegories that we find in comic books. So we talked about how, you know, it's kind of a, um, a story for the, the civil rights movement. Uh -huh. And a lot of conversations about Martin, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. Right. And um, lots of conversations about what's right and what's not right. And a lot of conversations about English text and the way we use words. So all of this, like I just put the book in front of them. I had guiding questions, maybe five or six um, every day for whatever text we were going to read that day. And it was hinged pretty much on what the text was saying, but also on the picture. Mm. Because I had done a lot of research that was talking about how kids are losing their ability to understand facial expressions as well. Right. So I kind of put that to test too, just because I was interested. Um, and the kids kind of struggled with understanding the facial expressions of the characters in the book. And um, so that whole that whole page with the the N word on it, right. that that was the that was the controversy of the book at the time. Right. Um, that whole page kind of um, depicts Kitty Pride and and um, her dance teacher, which is a good friend of hers, and they discuss how the how the the guy in the text calls her a beauty. Right. And um, her dance teacher tries to just, you know, the discord by saying, you know, it's just a word, it's not a big deal. And and Kitty Price says, but you know that if they would have used, and they used the N word, right. that you would have been upset too. And there's 
five or six panels that capture the the weight of those words and her reaction to how she would have felt if that was her and how she understood what Kitty Pride was was really meaning by the weight of that word. And I mean, it took us, I mean, that was like a class time. So it was about, you know, almost, almost a 50 minute class time where the kids were enthralled in trying to understand why it mattered and why she would look that way and why, and all of those things. And, and these were things that they brought up and these were things that they were interested in. I just put in their hands and guided them a little bit. And the rest of it, they made the, the switch. I had kids after that going to free comics today. I had kids that would go and do, you know, as much as they could finding graphic novels in, in, you know, whatever store they could find them in, but also at the library. And so readership went up. A lot of the comic book, you know, like our comic book brethren were all like, you have to start talking about this. Yeah. And we were, we were quickly invited to panels at conventions because they were interested in having an educator come speak, but there wasn't anybody that was willing. Um, I have experience, and, and I was pulling lots of research and doing just research on my own. And, um, and in the meantime, I took a new job. So um, doing the cons and talking to all of these different you know, educators and parents and people that would come to the to the panel, I started talking to comic book creators and a lot of them were like, you know, my kids learned how to read on comic books and they struggled in school but comic books really helped. A lot of a lot of the things that I've read have said that, you know, we they made the comparison to when our kids are young. When our children are very young, we give them books of pictures. There's lots of pictures and very little words. And as they go through you know, preschool and kindergarten and first grade and even second grade, there's pictures. Sure. And then all of a sudden we take the pictures away or the pictures get less and less. And we say, well, you in kindergarten through second grade were learning to read. And now you're reading to learn. And by taking those pictures away and taking that, that piece of developmentally appropriate comprehensible input, we have said, here, just read this. And then we make them analyze and do all kinds of stuff with it that they don't want to read anymore. Right. The, the magic of going to another place is completely gone because our kids don't know how to visualize. And and sometimes when reading a struggle, visualizing is going to be a struggle too because if half the words in the sentence you don't know, you can't possibly visualize it. Right. So we're losing entire groups of kids to even being able to read. So it kind of grew from that. And just recently, um, the, the bookings for panels to stand on and talk to, you know, fellow fellow educators has gotten much, much bigger. Right. So it's just becoming kind of um, a movement that I didn't expect to yeah. become a movement. But, but I think that when we talk about how scary it is for our kids to either be illiterate or illiterate, then, you know, we can't do everything by video. No. Lots of the communication tools we use have to be read. So reading is still the key to being successful later on in life. I agree. And I think, I mean, I have, I have a few questions. I mean, regarding what, let me ask you this. What is, what do you feel like the, the next move is for this? Do you have like a, a future plan that you, you you see or you envision as far as this program goes? Most of it really hinges on putting these books in the hands of educators because yeah. as educators, we don't really make a lot of money. And yeah. yes, we do dispense a lot of our paycheck back into our classroom yep. and for our students. But when we're talking comic books and we're talking graphic novels, if you're if you're using them both for free choice reading or for um, you know curriculum studies, right? Then it becomes something that can end up being pricey. So what I really want to do is make those books that educators are interested in available in slightly larger quantities than one. Um, and, you know, find partnerships with comic book shops that wouldn't mind giving discounts and doing things like that or donating certain books, um, as well as having a place where teachers can, you know, take the 
lessons that they have created or ideas that they have and start putting them into a hub where other people that are also interested in it can use it, improve it, and then repost it. So, for example, like we teach with the FSA, but um, comments where it might go away in the state of Florida. So whatever they change the standards to, everything that we've done up until this point would have to be, you know, remastered and repurposed. Sure. So you could take an, a lesson or a book or questions or ideas that someone else had posted, improve upon it, change standards, include other things, and then repost it so that there's always a place where people can go to find something. So at the end of the day, I want every book that, you know, somebody purchases from us, because the atomic book is in the hands of a kid, wow. um, and then have that hub available so that teachers can post, um, adjust, and repost um, different, different comic book types lessons so that they can use them in their classroom. Now, do you have um, specific comics that you, you recommend for any teachers out there that it, uh, for, for the classroom? A lot of the middle school stuff tends to come from kind of older books. Uh -huh. I'm putting together a list right now for smaller kids. Um, a lot of people have talked about Owly. Um, Bone is a great book uh -huh. by Jess Smith. Yep. Um, the new Miss Marvel with her being um, Pakistani. Oh, is yeah. Huge. Um, I mean, Miss Marvel in general. I mean, anything that you could put your hands on mm -hmm. is relevant now with the movie coming out. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, a, a lot of the X Men books are great when you're talking about differences, racism, you know, uh, civil rights. And then, um, we had talked about the, the death of Superman and uh, the, the, the book called uh, Red Sun, which is the one where Superman doesn't, doesn't crash land on Earth, but he crash lands in Russia, communist Russia, uh -huh. and, is, um, and is raised there. So what, what would have happened alternatively to you know him had that been his upbringing? Comic books aren't just that you know, cartoon on a page, it really makes you think about things. It makes you think about the hero's journey and it makes you think about, you know, how the comic book author is, is, is telling you about the world because art really, or life really does imitate art. And if we are, you know, putting this in the hands of kids, then they can understand it on a totally different level. Yeah. Vocabulary is higher in comic books. I mean, just, just the benefits outweigh anything that could be negative. Now, if I'm a teacher listening to this right now, how can I find out more? How can I learn more from you? Is there is there a place I can go that you that you have up right now and and, and running? Do you have like a Facebook page or a website, anything like that right now? Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Okay. Um, you can find us at Comics Comics in the Classroom FL on Facebook. Great. And you can find us at um, CIT Classroom on Twitter and Instagram. And then you can also find us, we also have an email address where you can message any of us on the team. Right. Um, that's CIT Classroom FL at gmail.com. Okay. And then as you can also um, check out some of the other just some of the other texts that we've been reading. So we've we've found articles and research done by the Christian Science Monitor, Cambridge, Harvard. You know, all these people are also talking about it, as well as other classes that are being offered from actual universities and studies of comic books and science fiction. Wow. So um, uh, I modeled a lot of what I'm kind of doing through um, Pop Culture Classroom. Excellent. Well, Nicole, thank you so much for joining us today. I very much appreciate you breaking that all down. One more thing before I uh, let you go here, though. Um, one question that my partners and I really wanted to ask you was, do you find yourself, ever since you, you started um, you know, engaging with, with this in the classroom, do you find your personal 
attraction to comics greater than maybe it was before that you've, you know, you, you seem, you spend a lot of time studying them almost, you know, like not a lot of people actually look at comic books the same way you are. So in a sense, you have, you know, this analysis that a lot of people haven't even really thought about making. So do you find yourself a bit more attracted to them now or what are your feelings? Um, so I think I do spend a lot more time in the racks of comic book shops looking at, you know, how I could use it and, and what people would enjoy. So I guess it has changed that, but I was always kind of a comic book geek in a way. Sure. So it kind of worked. Right. Um, I was reading, I mean, I was reading more adult comics, you know, like I was reading Strangers in Paradise and I was reading The Crow by J.O. Barr and oh, I was sure. reading... I was reading um, Tarot by Jim Ballant and, and Holly Golightly. So I was reading slightly more racy stuff as, as a young adult yeah. in my 20s. But then I started reading stuff that people just hand to me and say, you know, here's an X-Men comic. And I'd read it and I'd be like, oh, wow. <laughs> and I'd just be excited about, just excited about what, you know, what was on the pages. Yeah. And I did look at it a little bit more critically. So I don't know if, one started the other, or if I just kind of finally put them together. Sure. Um, but it kind of grew into kind of a labor of love, and I just got excited about people sharing that. I mean, as education grows and we become so test-minded, you know, standardized tests become what we're graded by as teachers, and we're evaluated on how our kids do and whether our kids can read and whether our kids can do math at the grade level they're supposed to. And right. I think it kills a lot of our community. And we're like, well, that's mine. I used it. My kids are gaining and yours aren't. Yeah. And, you know, we, we have to put that back in the schools where we're saying, let's share this information because if I'm doing it and if I'm succeeding with my kids, then why wouldn't I want you to replicate that and put it in your classroom to succeed with those kids as well? Exactly. I mean, because everything we do as teachers, if you're in it for the right reasons, then you're doing it for the good of the kid. Yeah. And not really, I mean, for the good of the kids means you're doing it for the good of yourself because if you're kid-minded, you're helping them to access the test in different ways. Right. And making them use their brain in a different way to be able to pass the test. And and I know it sounds like it's the end-all, be-all, but it's difficult to live in a world where standardized tests don't dictate everything that we teach our kids. Yeah. Comic books teach them so much more. Sure. And novels teach them so much more. I mean, I'm pretty much a cheerleader for anything that kids are going to read. Sure. I always tell my kids, I kind of quote Neil Gaiman and say, you know, reading should be fun and it should take you places. And yep. and if you don't like to, I don't believe that you don't like to read because you just haven't found the right book. Right. I mean, I, there's something out there for everybody. And when you, I was looking up just statistics about reading and illiteracy in the, in this country. And if you, they surveyed prisons and 75% of inmates in prison are either illiterate or illiterate, which mm. means that they can't read or they can't read at grade level or anywhere near where they would be progressive, productive members of society. Wow. And that's frightening. It is. So as much as we want to say, you know, it doesn't matter. Our kids look it through. It does matter. Our kids have to have options. And they have to be able to read to have all those options. Right. Wow. Well, Nicole, I really do want to thank you again for joining us. You're doing some amazing things. And I really hope that there's more teachers out there that start engaging um, maybe even just a little bit the same way you have, I think, um, I think a lot of us, um, you know, especially us comic book people like myself started reading, you know, or found our passions for reading through comic books. And I think that, you know, if there's, if there's that much more of a chance to get a child reading that way and, you know, and their, and the, the, their trusted teachers are, you know, showing them that way, I think there can be a lot of benefit to be had from that. So again, thank you so much for what you're doing and thank you so much for joining us here today. Oh, you're welcome. And I love being here. So I appreciate the soundbite, you know, I appreciate sure. having somebody want to listen to what we're doing.